welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine health research digested for you. My name is Dr. Clayton Johnson, and I'm your host for today's episode. Joining me on today's episode is Dr. Anna Paula with Iowa State University. Welcome, Anna, to the podcast. Hello, Dr. Clayton. How are you? I'm very good. Uh, Pleasure to talk to you today. Um, Anna, for anybody in the audience that maybe has not had the pleasure to meet you, could you give the audience a little background on yourself? Sure. Uh, Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, So uh, I'm almost defending my PhD, so I'm a PhD candidate. Uh, Nowadays, I'm working as a postdoc at a field app team at ISU with Gustavo Silva and Daniel Linares. Uh, So I did my PhD uh, with Dr. Maria Clavio and Jeffrey Zierman on mycoplasma diagnostics. And I got my DVM uh, back in Brazil. And I also got a a master's in epidemiology in Brazil. So that's good. Excellent. I I can't say. (laughs) You have an excellent team to work with. Uh, I've worked closely with Gustavo and Daniel and the entire field epi team. And you guys do tremendous work and really appreciate everything that you bring to our industry. And Anna, I know your focus has been mycoplasma hyopneumoniae diagnostics. Let's start out by telling everybody, why is this important? Why should producers and veterinarians care about optimizing their diagnostic strategies for mycoplasma hyopneumoniae? Yeah, I, I can see that uh, producers and uh, veterinarians have been succeeding in eliminating mycoplasma from several f- from flows, from entire flow or for some farms. And diagnostics play a role when you have a role when you have this negative farm that's selling goods for other farms. So Maybe the flow needs to make sure those guilts are negative and it's not going to happen to have a positive and uh, get an outbreak in a downstream flow. So I think in this situation, diagnostic plays a, a really important flow, a really important role. The other aspect on mycoplasma that I can see an application that we we try to be more effective is when you decide to eliminate mycoplasma, you're going to need um, intense testing uh, to determine that you have a day zero of elimination, then count that specific time to for the herd to be able to eliminate the mycoplasma based on the incubation and transmission and all this epidemiological aspects of mycoplasma that needs to be considered when you're eliminating. Uh, another, another, maybe a third one, it's if it's decided or not, if you're gonna use some uh, guilt acclimation based on intention exposure, you may want to check if your exposure was efficient or you may need to expose guilts. Excellent. So we've got um, our routine monitoring of expected naive herds, multiplication herds, even commercial herds that are expected to be naive. And then we've got all the elimination diagnostics. We've got the diagnostics to establish day zero, the day we know all animals were infected. And then also the diagnostics to monitor as that herd goes from being 100% infected to hopefully eventually 0% infected in the eradication, or I should say the elimination for the farm has been successful. Let's talk about uh, the sample types, Santa Paula, as you have compared sample types. So what type of sample we can send to the lab? Uh, what sample types have you looked at? And what have you learned in terms of the sensitivity and specificity across those sample types? Yeah, so here at Ivy State, we are more focused on understanding the performance of oral fluids, serum, and tracheal uh, swabs. So about tracheal swabs, we know mycoplasma is, 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 resides down the tracheal, so tracheal swab, it's catching the mycoplasma and it's side of infection, so it's going to be applied and we're going to be Uh, is going to give you a robust performance in terms of diagnostic sensitivity or diagnostic specificity 
for any situation from the expected naive herd to the confirmed exposure in a recently infected herd. So we know if tracheal swabs are gonna have the earliest detection, uh, you're not gonna have false alarms or false positive results. That is a, an a issue for the expected herd, expected naive na uh, herd that's selling uh, guilt. It's, it's, it's bad for them. And you're gonna, because of the highest performance, you're always gonna need you're going to need lower sample size compared to serum and oral fluids. So serum, it's going to, in terms of diagnostics, if it's, your goal is to detect micro, it's applied for non-vaccinated animals. We still don't have a DIVA uh, test for uh, mycoplasma. So for serial, we know that we need to take, we need to consider the incubation time within a pig of mycoplasma. It can be long. A pig can serial convert after 28 days. We, we haven't seen that in several trials and several publications. And so as an effect to have a good sensitivity using serum sampling, you're gonna need collect a little later your samples. So it's not that good, it's not, uh, it's not compared to tracheal swab, a good uh, sensitivity, you need some more time to be able to detect and you're gonna need a, a higher sample size as well because of the percentage or proportion of animals serial converting in the population. Sorry to interrupt, Anna Paula, but sure, you talked sure. about a, a DIVA diagnostic test. Could you talk yeah. about what that means for mycoplasma and why that's important as we monitor herds? Yeah, because if you have a DIVA vaccine that could be deferred from the 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 test, you could still use you could use the ELISA in a vaccinated uh, herd, hmm. and we. We still don't have that, uh, or is not implemented uh, yet in, in the laboratories here in the U.S. Yeah. So the diva, the diva uh, vaccine would allow vaccine. us to use an ELISA and tell if the antibodies are from the vaccine or from a wild type or of field. Yeah, field. But today we can't do that. Infection. We know that there are antibodies there, but we have no idea if they are only from the vaccine or if they are from an infection yes. or both. Yes. That's, Very good. that's right. And the other one that we try to use for mycoplasma, but we are not, it's, there is some cavities, is the oral fluids uh, sample. So oral fluids are in an amazing example of an aggregate sample type we, we could use to uh, sample a higher number of animals because we're going to hang up hang a rope in a pen, so all that pen could be screening for Michael. But as I mentioned, in, in, we know that mycoplasma resides on the tracheal, down the tracheal. So, and we did a research to um, determine which situation could be a, a good one for mycoplasma detection in uh, oral fluids. And you saw that if you have a coughing, uh, the cough is gonna, I would say, push out the mm -hmm. micro to the oral cavity. That's you're right. You're gonna have higher chances to detect micro uh, using the oral fluids. Yeah, if you've got the cough, you've got the clinical signs. So you signs. know that the you know the oral fluids are a good, easy uh, sample to collect at that point, and you probably don't need to go through the hassle of like a deep tracheal swab or something that's more restrain. Invasive. Yeah, you don't need to restrain the any animals. Just and you could use the same sample type to do uh, different uh, testing. We say that oral fluids are a feasible uh, sample because you could use the same sample to test for PERS or sure. influenza or PDV. Yep, very convenient and very broad in terms of what you can do with that sample.
Yeah, it's a powerful sample. But for Michael, there is some issues that we try to understand uh, better. Maybe um, we have another research trying to figure out the best uh, PCR protocols. And we compare some, we compared four protocols and we saw they perform differently. Uh -huh. So we believe there is a space here for the laboratories to improve their uh, PCR and maybe one day uh, oral food could be a better sample type for mycoplasma diagnostics. Very good. Let's talk a little bit, uh, Anna Paula, about those false positives that you might get, or at least you perceive it's a false positive. Um, mm -hmm. I know in the field it happens uh, too frequently. Um, and as you said, it's a huge disruption for a multiplier because if there are no clinical signs of mycoplasma pneumonia in an expected, expected naive population, when you get you know one serum sample back that's ELISA positive or ELISA suspect, it's very hard to think that it's real. Um, so as you guys have looked at different ELISAs and the quality from sensitivity and specificity of different ELISAs, and then also the cost, because cost is a factor, right? What, um, what is the best ELISA test for producers with cost considered? And then um, what should you do as a follow-up if you get one of those situations where you find a false positive, what you think is a false positive result? Yeah, that's a, a, a good question. Uh, yeah, we did a comparison of the six uh, most used ELISAs, and we saw there, there are three ELISAs that they perform equally. They have um, statistical similar diagnostic sensitivity and diagnostic specificity. So a producer could select any of, of these three ELISAs um, to perform um, its testing. However, they should, because of the diagnostic specificity is not 100%, you're gonna have the false positive. So we still need to rely and go back if you have a false positive result and you believe it's a false positive because it's expected the herd be naive, try to guide or guide the producers to go back to the farm and do some tracheal swabs to investigate investigate this uh, false uh, false alarm unexpected mm -hmm. alarm and going back to the tracheal so there is some research at our University of Minnesota did one and also we did another one similar uh, it's about tracheal pulling that mm -hmm. could be because the cavity of uh, PCR is the cost. If you compare an ELISA, it's six or five dollars for testing, but a PCR could be thirty or twenty-five dollars for a test. Yep. So we saw that tracheal pooling could uh, help to decrease uh, the test. So it could decrease by five times, as shown by our research of uh, University of Minnesota and also another research here I, I state we we saw that pulling by 10 also could give you a good uh, sensitive to detect the mycoplasma and then decrease the cost. Excellent. Very good. Well, thank you very much, Anna, for taking some time today to educate our audience on all the different options that are out there for mycoplasma yeah. diagnostics. It's a topic that's very important for business transactions, for guilt movements in particular. Yeah. Um, much of the United States industry has transitioned to being mycoplasma naive, which is excellent but it's the old uh, test and verify type program, right? So it's important information for producers. I wanna thank you, Anna, for coming on to the show and, and to our audience. Thank you very much for listening to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast. If you haven't visited us at the website, please go do so. Um, check us out at swinehealthblackbelt.com. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss out on next week's episode. For Dr. Anna Paula, I'm Dr. Clayton Johnson. Thank you very much for attending and we'll see you next week. Hey everyone, we're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. 
If you have a swine health related research trial and would like to come on the show to talk about it with me and share it with our audience, feel free to send an email to healthblackbelt at swineit.com. And we would love to take a look at your research. Thank you.